All right, moving on. The last section, 4.3, covered uh, prokaryotic cells and their characteristics. So we now enter into several sections of the textbook where we're talking about eukaryotic cells, the kinds of cells that we have, uh, the kinds of cells that all animals, plants, fungi, and protists have. And of course, uh, what the name eukaryotic means is true nucleus. All cells that belong to the eukarya group have a nucleus where the DNA is stored or housed inside of a membrane. And that's where the name eukaryotic comes from. There's other, uh, there are other unique features or characteristics that eukaryotic cells have that prokaryotic cells don't have. And in general, uh, the biggest one is membrane-bound organelles. Uh, these are separate compartments, separate little rooms or chambers inside the cell, the eukaryotic cell, any eukaryotic cell, it doesn't matter what you're looking at. And uh, separate membrane-bound compartments and what this does is it helps to isolate the chemistry that's going on in these different places, making the chemistry more efficient. And uh, by making the cell basically more efficient in its chemistry, eukaryotic cells are able to get bigger than prokaryotic cells. Our cells are still bound by that surface area to volume relationship. We can't escape that is physics, uh, but uh, by making our cells more efficient with membrane-bound organelles, we're able to sort of stretch those limits a little bit more. Now, uh, not all eukaryotic cells are the same, even though there are many characteristics that are shared, uh, they're not all the same. So, for example, plant cells and fungal cells and some protists uh, have cell walls and the cell walls aren't always made of exactly the same thing either, but they have cell walls. They have rigid uh, boundaries around their plasma membranes that give their cells shape and structure. Uh, animal cells are unique in having uh, little structures called centrioles, and you might hear about those a little bit later. Plant cells uh, have chloroplasts. Those are the places where photosynthesis takes place to make sugar. And plant cells have what's called a central vacuole, which is a large chamber inside the cell filled with water and other materials. So the figure that's on the slide is of an animal cell. And uh, most of the characteristics that are shown are shared by all eukaryotic cells. Uh, but again, if you look closely, you'll see number 12 says centriole. So that's one characteristic that is unique to animals. Otherwise, most everything else here is shared by all eukaryotes. There's another figure in your textbook showing a plant cell. I'm not showing that to you here. Uh, but take a look at it. It's part of your reading questions and uh, just be familiar with what plant cells have that our cells do not have. Okay, moving on. So the first place we're going to begin with eukaryotic cells and looking at some more detail is with the nucleus. And our book uh, refers to the nucleus as the control center of each cell. Fair enough, that works. Uh, it's referred to as a control center because that's where our DNA is located. That's where our DNA is housed. Uh, it's like taking all the reference books that have all the information about everything we need to know to run our society and putting those reference books in a library. <laughs> if you want to access that information, you've got to go to the library. So in a similar way, our DNA is like those reference books uh, and the nucleus is like our library. And you might recall from earlier in our class that DNA is used for two primary things, information storage, 
which, hey, that's what a library is for, and information transmission, heredity, passing on that information from cell to cell or from parent to offspring. So all that information is in the nucleus. Now let's cover a little bit of anatomy of the nucleus. Uh, the nucleus is surrounded by a double membrane, and it's called the nuclear envelope. It holds all the DNA and other materials inside and controls what goes in and out. Kind of like the plasma membrane of the entire cell holds in the cytoplasm and controls what goes in and out. Now that nuclear envelope has little tiny, tiny holes in it. These are just a few nanometers in size, billionths of a meter, super tiny. We can see them with an electron microscope uh, at a pretty powerful magnification. They're really small. And those nuclear pores allow the transport of proteins, which are pretty big molecules, RNA, which can be pretty big, and the parts to ribosomes called ribosomal subunits. So primarily those three things are moving in and out of the nuclear pores. Now the ribosomal subunits are assembled or built in a region of the nucleus called the nucleolus. Take a look at the figure that's on the middle of your slide and the nucleolus is colored uh, very dark purple. And it's in that region of the nucleus that uh, the nuclear material is super condensed, super packed together. Now the overall fluid that's in the nucleus is called the nucleoplasm, sort of like cytoplasm. It's in the nucleus. And that fluid is based on water as a solvent, and it contains nucleotides, the building blocks for making DNA and RNA. And the nucleoplasm contains enzymes, proteins that help speed up certain chemical reactions. Now, uh, the DNA is actually combined with proteins. There's proteins that are attached to the DNA. And that combination of DNA and proteins in the nucleus, the nucleus is packed with this stuff, is called chromatin chromatin. And uh, when the chromatin is really tightly wound up, like taking a rope and just winding it and winding it and packing it into a ball, then we can see uh, that chromatin through a microscope. And uh, when we see those structures of chromatin that are super packed together, those are called chromosomes. So chromosomes are individual little packets of DNA separated from other packets, and the DNA is all wound up around proteins forming, again, these discrete little packages called chromosomes. Didn't put this on the slide, but we as humans have 46 separate pieces of chromatin in each nucleus of our cells, at least most humans do. And those separate pieces, again, are called chromosomes. So we have 46 chromosomes. Our closest living animal relatives are chimpanzees and bonobos. And they have 48 chromosomes, very close to us. In fact, we've come to understand that we have two fewer chromosomes than they do because our ancestors took those two chromosomes that our ancestors once shared and combine them together uh, to form two fewer chromosomes. We know this by looking at the structure of the chromosomes and we can see, see where this happened. So, but anyway, that's a little bit of extra information about our own human chromosomes. Different species have different numbers. There's nothing magical about that. Uh, but uh, remember what chromosomes are because we will be coming back to that when we cover cell division in a later chapter and heredity in a later chapter. So remember, I just told you and on, on the last slide that uh, the, the two pieces of ribosomes,
subunits. They're called ribosomal subunits. Those pieces are made in the nucleus. They're put together and manufactured in the nucleus. And these two separate pieces called subunits, one of them is bigger than the other. So there's uh, what's called the large subunit and the small subunit. They are transported out of the nucleus through the nuclear pores. Once they are in the cytoplasm of a cell outside the nucleus, then uh, those subunits can come together, sort of connect together like two Legos, and they form a ribosome. And you should remember, ribosomes are the places where the genetic code is used to make polypeptides. Now, as I mentioned, these two subunits are different sizes, but they're both made of the same stuff. They're mostly made of ribosomal RNA. So it's RNA material uh, that is specifically part of ribosomes. It's not found anywhere else in the cell. And proteins, so some proteins. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, these are made in the nucleolus. Now, once in the cytosol, once in the fluidy part of our cells, uh, outside the nucleus, they come together to form complete ribosomes. And those ribosomes are located in two places, two locations. Ones that are just kind of floating free in the cytosol are called free ribosomes. And they are used to make proteins that, uh, like enzymes, that are used right there in the cytosol. They don't need to be sent anywhere. They don't need to go anywhere. These proteins are just used right there in the cytosol. Other ribosomes are attached to the outside of the endoplasmic reticulum. And those are literally called attached ribosomes. And those ribosomes are making proteins that are going to be shipped somewhere. They're going to be sent somewhere. They need to go to a specific destination. So those kinds of proteins are made at the ribosomes. They are the polypeptides are actually, and they are inserted into the pouches of the endoplasmic reticulum. And then from there, the polypeptides are processed. And I'm going to get to that um, the next slide or two about the endoplasmic reticulum. So I'll hold off on more details. But just to summarize, this whole entire slide is just focused on ribosomes in eukaryotic cells, reminding you that the parts are made in the nucleus. They come out into the cytosol, the fluid parts of our cells, and they can either be free ribosomes or attached ribosomes, depending on where the proteins are gonna go that they are making. Well, now let's enter into the endomembrane system. Insane in the endomembrane. <laughs> uh, the endomembrane system is made up of all those parts of a eukaryotic cell that share pieces of membrane. By definition, you are part of the endomembrane system if you are sharing pieces of membrane with other parts of the cell. Uh, basically, this is happening because pieces of membrane are like pinching or budding off of one location to form what's called transport vesicles, little containers, little bubbles of membrane that have molecules inside of them. And those transport vesicles are moved uh, to another location where those molecules are then going to be processed or sorted or used or whatever. Now, I've listed here on this slide what, which major parts of a eukaryotic cell uh, are involved in the endomembrane system. So the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi complex, lysosomes, vesicles and vacuoles, and the plasma membrane. So we're going to go over virtually all of these. We've talked about the plasma membrane already but we'll especially go over the other uh, parts one by one. Now, after we review the endomembrane system, this is a job for you. Uh, you should be able to describe the pathway that molecules take 
from the point where they're being synthesized or manufactured in a cell, and that's usually going to be in the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, to where their final destination is. Okay, so that would be like a little essay question for you to be able to answer. That would show that you really understand some of the dynamics of what's going on in our cells. Take a look at this figure before you move on. Uh, in fact, this is essentially what you'll be describing when you, you know, write a paragraph or something about this. So read it over, but uh, we're going to start off with the endoplasmic reticulum and move on from there on the next slide. Okay, so as I promised you on the last slide, we're going to go over the endoplasmic reticulum first. As Now, we've already talked about the nucleus, okay, and I mentioned on the last slide that is part of the endomembrane system uh, because the endoplasmic reticulum is physically attached to the nucleus in some places. And the phospholipids and proteins, you know, the membrane materials are basically being shared and kind of flowing back and forth between the nuclear envelope and the endoplasmic reticulum to some degree. There is some physical connection there. Now, endoplasmic reticulum. Endo means inside. Plasmic, well, it's inside the cytoplasm. Reticulum. If something is reticulated, it means it's like branching, like a maze. So basically, the name endoplasmic reticulum is describing where it is and what it looks like. You can think of it as a biosynthetic factory. So when you're trying to remember and you're learning what the endoplasmic reticulum does, what its functions are, biosynthetic factory. It's made up of interconnected tubules, little tiny tubes, uh, and that part of the endoplasmic reticulum is called the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. You like the way I say that? Smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The reason why it's called that is because there are no ribosomes attached to the outside of it, so the surface looks smooth. And that is physically connected to what is called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. By the way, that's the favorite organelle of dogs. That's why they always say rough, rough, rough. They just can't say endoplasmic reticulum. I mean, can you blame them? And these are um, abbreviated SER and RER for short. So let's take a quick look at what these two types of endoplasmic reticulum do. Smooth ER first. The smooth ER is the site of lipid and polysaccharide synthesis. So that means all the lipids, the fats and oils, waxes, steroids, phospholipids, they're primarily made here. And polysaccharides, like say for example, glycogen, that gets stored in your muscle after your meals. It gets assembled in uh, the smoothie arm. Another important um, function of the smooth ER, though, is detoxification of drugs and poisons, things that you ingest into your body. So this explains why you, say, have to take, say you have a headache, and you take an ibuprofen or a Tylenol, and hey, six hours later, you might need to take more. Why? Because your body is going, hey, there's some chemicals in here that don't belong. They're foreign to the body. I need to get rid of them. These don't belong here. So your blood takes those chemicals to your cells, especially of your liver, and where there's a lot of smooth ER in those cells, and your endoplasmic reticulum there modifies and breaks down those chemicals, which your body takes to be, you know, like foreigners, not supposed to be there. Um, this also explains the phenomenon of tolerance, because if you're taking uh, drugs for a long period of time, and I don't mean just implicitly uh, like illegal drugs, any drugs, prescription drugs, uh, a physician might need to increase your dosage periodically. Why? Because the smooth ER in your liver cells is adjusting to this constant barrage of chemicals 
and making more and more smooth ER to process it, which means that you break down those drugs more quickly and you have to increase your dosage. This is why alcoholics are able to put down tons of beer or booze or whatever because their livers get so good at processing it that they have to drink more to get the same effect. That phenomenon is called tolerance, when you build up tolerance to certain chemicals. The rough ER, what does it do? It's the site of glycoprotein synthesis, glycoprotein. These are proteins that have sugar molecules attached to them. So I've got four little asterisks under there. It's basically telling you the pathway that polypeptides take as they move through the rough ER. You should be able to describe this pathway. It's part of the endomembrane system. So first of all, you've got ribosomes that are attached to the outside of this part of the endoplasmic reticulum. That's why it's called the rough ER. And at those ribosomes, the genetic code is being used to make polypeptides. Those polypeptides are inserted into the pouches of the ER. It's called the lumen. The lumen is the space inside. Now, once those polypeptides are in there, they might be combined in various ways to make proteins. Remember, proteins usually have two or more polypeptides that are part of them. That's the quaternary level of structure. Once you've got a protein, then sugars are attached to it, okay, chemically added. And now you have a glycoprotein. Okay, but now we have to do something with those glycoproteins. So they get packaged up into little bubbles of membrane to send those uh, molecules to the next destination. And those little bubbles of membrane that come off of the endoplasmic reticulum are called transport vesicles. They're like little taxis that are shuttling molecules from the ER to the Golgi apparatus or the Golgi complex. That's what we're going to talk about next. So this is what you need to know about the ER. So uh, we'll wrap this up now and then move on to the Golgi complex. Okay, we just covered the endoplasmic reticulum and logically what comes next is the Golgi complex. Why does it logically come next? Because little tiny uh, bubbles of membrane called transport vesicles are leaving the endoplasmic reticulum continuously being shipped out. And where do they go? They go to the Golgi complex. The Golgi complex is comprised of, it's made up of, flattened membranous sacs, pouches called Golgi bodies. Each little sac or pouch is called a Golgi body, and a whole bunch of them all stacked up together uh, is called a Golgi complex. So you can see on the uh, figure that I've inserted here, it actually labels Golgi apparatus. That's the same thing as Golgi complex. There are different names out there in textbooks that biologists call this. And your textbook calls it the Golgi complex. But I really think you should know both names, Golgi complex and apparatus. That way, if you read about them, you know they're the same. So transport vesicles arrive from the ER and they uh, fuse together. Uh, so little, little, little tiny membrane pouches fuse together to form bigger pou uh, pouches. And so with these little vesicles all glomming together and fusing together, you get a Golgi body, a big pouch. And these pouches, these bodies contain all the, the chemicals coming from the ER. So What's coming from the ER? Just as a reminder, glycoproteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. All those things are made in the ER. As the Golgi bodies migrate or move through each complex or apparatus, there's chemistry going on inside those Golgi bodies, and the chemistry is modifying the, the molecules. It's getting them in their final finished form. The, uh, the, the final forms of the molecules that are actually going to do their business in cells. Um, kind of like, you know, after rough manufacturing of an automobile, it goes down the assembly line and little refinements are made on it to get into its final form to go into a, you know, a sales parking lot or something. 
So uh, basically we can say the molecules are chemically modified, then they're sorted, so sorted out, and they're packaged once again into transport vesicles where they're gonna be shipped to their final destination. So if you look closely at the figure, which I always recommend, it shows you number one, transport vesicle from the ER. So those are coming and combining to make a new Golgi body. Then uh, number two, it shows them you know, combining to make a body. Number three, that Golgi body is migrating through an apparatus or complex. And that's the, what the green arrow is showing. The bodies are just continuously migrating through like they're on a conveyor belt. And when they get to the opposite side of the Golgi complex, then that's the shipping side and new vesicles form that get sent out. If you look at the electron microscope image, I can ask you, is that a TEM or an SEM? That's a thin slice. So that would be a TEM. Uh, you can see these vesicles coming out of the, the shipping side. On the bottom left of your slide, I basically put steps of what happens in the Golgi complex, just to break it down uh, um, to, in detail. Transport vesicles arrive from the ER. They fuse together to form new bodies. As the bodies move through the complex, the chemicals or uh, molecules are chemically modified and sorted. New vesicles form on the shipping side and the molecules are sent to their final destinations. What are those final destinations? A lot of them are being shipped to the plasma membrane and those molecules might become part of the plasma membrane. Or the molecules could be secreted from the cell, released from the cell to the outside. Um, or the molecules are used by different organelles in the cell. So in which case the vesicles are leaving the Golgi and then being sent like back to the endoplasmic reticulum where they need to be used. So there's a variety of different places they can be shipped. But as I started off saying, the primary one is probably the uh, plasma membrane. All right, there's one kind of specialized organelle that comes from the Golgi complex. And this org these organelles are called lysosomes. Let's cover a little bit of Greek or Latin. Some or soma means body. Ooh, you've already seen that in this narrated PowerPoint when we introduced the word chromosome. <laughs> Chromo means color, and some, as I just told you, means body. So those things we call chromosomes literally translates to colored bodies. Why? Well, I'll tell you why right now. Because in the 1800s, when biologists started really looking at cells and paying attention to them, they added some dyes or stains to a microscope slides, and at some point they saw these little colored bodies in the cells. They didn't know what they were but they called them chromosomes. Now we know what they are. They contain DNA and proteins, but we still use that same name. Lyso, lyso comes from the word lysis. It means to split, to break apart. So lysosomes are bodies that split things apart. Hmm, let's see why they're called that. Basically, lysosomes are specialized vesicles coming out of the Golgi. And these specialized vesicles contain powerful hydrolytic enzymes. It is enzymes that break up or chop up big molecules into small parts. And these enzymes are made in the endoplasmic reticulum. And they're shipped to the Golgi. And after they're touched up and refined and packaged into new vesicles, they are now in lysosomes. Now, most lysosomes, what do they do? They digest run-down or damaged organelles, like mitochondria. Mitochondria replicate and replace themselves in your cells. And about every 10 days, a mitochondrion will then split and form new ones. The old ones get uh, recycled, essentially. The figure is showing you a lysosome combining with a run-down, damaged, old mitochondrion. And it's basically 
uh, digesting it and breaking it up into little pieces that can be recycled in the cell. Okay, the other part of your figure is showing you a vesicle or a vacuole um, forming at the plasma membrane as it brings in material from outside the cell, like food from the outside the cell. This is how a paramecium or an amoeba feeds in a pond is basically the plasma membrane wraps around some food particle and brings it inside in a vesicle or vacuole. And then the little single-celled amoeba or paramecium might be like, well, how am I going to digest this? What am I going to do with this food? I don't have a stomach. I'm just a single cell. Well, that's what lysosomes are for. So a lysosome will attach to that little bubble of membrane, a food vesicle or a food vacuole, and will then digest the contents and use it inside the cell. So your book talks about, I had some reading questions for you to answer, some lysosomal storage disorders. So I'm not gonna repeat those or review those here. Uh, make sure you're familiar with them a little bit from your reading questions, okay? So that's it for lysosomes. Little digestive compartments is how you can think about them. Okay, this whole part two of chapter four is, is mostly focused on the endomembrane system. Uh, there are a couple other organelles we're going to cover in the last part, part three, including the mitochondria and chloroplasts, but they're not part of the endomembrane system. So we're going to end here essentially with vacuoles. Vacuoles are part of the endomembrane system. What is a vacuole? Again, these words come from Latin or Greek. If you looked, at, looked them up, you would uh, see that they basically translate to like a large storage compartment, a vacuole. And that's what they are in cells. They're large membranous pouches. Vesicles are small membranous pouches. Vacuoles are much bigger. So basically, vac vacuoles are gigantic vesicles in a way. So they're used for transport and they're used for storage. Okay, it depends on the kind of vacuole. Move myself down there. So vacuoles that form at the plasma membrane after a large pouch pinches off inside the cell. That's what was shown to you on the last slide when I was talking about lysosomes. Um, you know, maybe if an, an amoeba or paramecium engulfs a whole bacterial cell and brings it inside, that would qualify as a vacuole because that would be a pretty big pouch. And then those lysosomes would digest whatever was brought in in that vacuole. The, the figure that's in the upper right is showing you contractile vacuoles. So those form inside organisms that live in ponds or lakes or rivers and freshwater ecosystems. And those little single-celled creatures need to pump water out of their cells or their cells will fill up with water and explode. So contractile vacuoles are specialized um, compartments that gradually fill up with water, like a balloon. And then they're sent to the plasma membrane where they then get rid of the water. So basically bailing the water out of the cell so the cell doesn't expand with water and blow up. So that's contractile vacuoles. And finally, central vacuole. A few slides ago, I mentioned that plant cells uniquely have central vacuoles. They are used by plant cells for storing water, uh, for storing pigments that could um, you know, what makes uh, like parts of a plant be colorful. Uh, toxins. So if a plant is poisonous, shouldn't eat it. Uh, then those toxins, those poisons are probably stored in the central vacuole. So basically the central vacuole is a large storage chamber uh, in plant cells and takes up most of the volume of a plant cell. Okay, as I said, the next part, part three of this chapter, we'll uh, start off with mitochondria and chloroplasts, and then we'll talk about the cytoskeleton and some components that are outside of cells. Um, and then that'll finish up our discussion of eukaryotic cells. Um, so that's about it.
and uh, again reminding you that this ends the section on the endomembrane system.